so as you all know, uh, I was born in Germany and raised in Germany. And I don't know why some stories grab your heart and never let you go. And the following is a story I heard as a child. It was told by someone whose face I can't remember. I can't remember his name, uh, where we were, or why he told that story. I was not the only person in the room. That much I can remember. It was a war story. In the story, uh, the man was young, no more than 18 years old, and he was with an infantry unit somewhere in Russia during World War II. He was a replacement, and many replacements had joined the unit. There were only very few men left who had crossed into Russia on the first day of the campaign. And the unit had fought, and they bled, and they had moved deep into territory, into enemy territory, and then winter stopped them at the gates of Moscow. And they fought through winter, through spring, and through summer. And what was planned as a few we weeks of blitzkrieg, lightning war, had turned into a drawn-out campaign where both sides did not expect mercy and did not give it. And now it was fall again. It was harvest time, and the corn stood sky high on fields that stretched to the horizon. And the man is scared like he was never scared before. He walks through the corn and clings to his machine pistol. He can see a few meters, no more, so high and so dense is the corn. And he can hear the all other soldiers in his groups nearby as they slowly march forward. And they expect the enemy to open up on them at any time. And the man imagined how it would feel when a machine gun bullet hits him and tears him apart. And the veterans of his company uh, loved to tell gruesome tales about that and they enjoyed the fear on the faces of the newcomers. And he wonders if it will be over quickly or if his death will be obscenely slow. Will he be lying there in his blood screaming for his mother? And the veterans in the company predicted that exactly would happen to him. Newcomers are green, and because they are green, they don't know war, and because they don't know war, they will die. No use to remember someone's name who will be dead within a week. Come again in four weeks, and if you're still alive, then we will call you by your name and not, hey, you new guy. And the company moves forward, it seems, for hours. Nothing happens. Just fear and corn. But suddenly there is a Russian soldier just a meter or so away. And the Russian is as surprised as the German. And the Russian puts his hand in the air and the German is so scared by the movement that he pulls the trigger. And I don't remember the features of the man's face when he told that part of the story, but I, I vividly remember his expression. It was haunted and driven and almost crazy. And I remember exactly what he said. He said, his machine gun laughed. It laughed 32 times. It laughed until the magazine was empty and the Russian soldier was not recognizable as a human being anymore. And then he stood there in the cornfield, frozen solid, and his lieutenant came running and looked at the scene and said to him, Well, if you need a whole magazine for every single one of them, then we have to have an ammunition card for you alone. And then the company continued to advance, and the man went with them like a robot. And he went through many more battles. He saw death and destruction, but he never got hurt. Machine guns and artillery and airplanes and tanks killed all the men around him, but he didn't even get a scratch. He was in a house with dozens of men, and the house was hid, and all who were with him died, and he walked out without a scratch. But that first encounter with the Russian soldier haunted him every day of his life. And to find peace, he tried to reimagine the scene. He gave the Russian a fierce and murderous look like he was one of those caricatures in the propaganda posters. And he gave him a gun and a bayonet and a hand grenade, and he made him charge him, screaming a nerve-wracking cry. But nothing of that helped. Beneath all the imagination, the Russian soldier remained unarmed and young, a lost boy, who lifted his hands to surrender. And that 
was the only truth. I'm sure that many people go through war, may they be soldiers, may they be civilians who have a similar story to tell. Nobody lives through armed conflict and comes out of that experience the same person that went in. War changes us and often it makes us feel guilty. Guilty because we have taken lives or guilty because we have survived while many we know did not. Sometimes people find a way to live with that experience and too often they don't. The suicide rate among veterans is staggeringly high. And to those of you who watch on the internet and listen on the radio, if you are in a situation when continuing life seems more than you can bear, please call 988, the suicide and crisis hotline. Dial 988 and know that you're not alone and that helping you is possible even if it does not feel that way in the moment please give 988 a chance we all fall short of the glory of god we all are sinners and we all need god's grace because we cannot shed our sinful nature and sometimes we are aware that we are guilty in the eyes of god and sometimes we deny that in a more and more secular and materialistic society, the concepts of shame and sin and guilt seem anachronistic and outdated and utterly ridiculous. Sin is something the church uses to infuse you with a bad conscience so that you can, they can control your life and get your money. And that might be true for some places, but guilt is real. I don't know what happened what, to the man who told me this war story, but I remember the guilt that he carried with him. His guilt was about to overwhelm him. And often we push away guilt. Modern people, of course, do not conform to outdated moral standards that make us feel guilty. But even if we manage to push away guilt, it does not mean that it isn't there, lingering in our subconscious. And sometimes when we least expect it, it can break out of its prison, poison our souls and make life impossible. We have to make decisions how we deal with our guilt. We can push it even further away. But if we do that, if we ignore our guilt, we also have to push away what makes us human. I have met people like that too, people who sacrificed their souls to Nazi barbarism and who have never ever missed a good night's of sleep. But if you look closely, you see that you can't be a Nazi murderer and turn around and then be a normal person again. You will always be a murderer who lives behind a nice guy facade. And if you continue long enough, all that is left of you is a facade. And what should be the human core is hollow. You can pretend to love your wife, your children, and pet the dog. But they always, always sense the make-believe, the lie, the self-betrayal. You go through the motions of life, but behind that facade, you're already dead. If we are human... And if we want to stay human, we have to deal with our guilt. We are created in the image of God. We have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And hence, we know what sin is. We know how things should be and we know how things are. We might be willing to do what is right, but circumstances and our sinful nature can take us on a ride on which we completely lose ourselves. And greed, violence, self-indulgence, whatever it might be, we contribute to make this planet into a living hell. And when we recognize that, and we always recognize that, then we feel guilty. And that is why all religions on the planet, all spiritual movements that have ever existed, have ways to make humans right with the spirit of the universe, with the divine, the sacred, or however you address the creative power that makes human life possible. 
And that is not outdated humbug. It is desperately and deeply needed healing of the soul. John the Baptist reenacts the Exodus. He baptizes people in the River Jordan. And that is no coincidence. The people wander through the desert for 40 years to atone for their sins. Only when they were purified by the desert experience did God allow them to cross the River Jordan into the Holy Land. And that is what John the Baptist reenacts. The people repent. Their sins are washed away and then they cross through the Jordan back into the promised land where they then once again they live in right relationship with God and with each other. We as a community and as individuals yearn to live in right relationship with God and with each other. Even Non-religious people want that. They just use other language. Humans are created to live in harmony and peace. We need to confess, repent, and then open our hearts to receive absolution. Some do it in church. Some do it on the couch of a psychiatrist. Some do both. We need to leave the traumas of the past behind us in order to live into the future. And that is often difficult and uncomfortable, but it's a process that is well worth it. Confessing our guilt opens our hearts towards God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness paves the path to harmony and to peace. The peace we receive from God, that is a peace we can pour back into the world again. Following Jesus, we walk by faith one step at a time until one day we wake up in the kingdom of God. Amen.